and welcome to this month's episode of Money Mountaineering with actuary and author Peter Newworth. I'm Hope Katz Gibbs, producer of the show. Thrilled to be here with this month's guest, Erin Gruel. You may have seen her or heard about her in the movie Freedom Writers, starring Hilary Swank, which was amazing, where you learned about her experience educating kids that everyone thought were uneducatable. So she actually turned her work working with these kids in California into the Freedom Writers Diary. She still works with them. And we are going to learn all about that tonight on this month's episode of Bunny Mountaineering. So take it away, Pete. Well, thanks very much, Hope. And and Erin, I'm so thrilled and honored to have you on the guest. I mean, I'm frankly a little bit starstruck. I mean, I watched that movie and I understand it was, it's been 30 years, which is sort of, uh, even though it's been 30 years, it's super fresh and it's, it was a wonderful movie and just a wonderful um, experience now talking to you. And I just to put things, this in context for, for the people that, you know, often listen to me talk, um, you know, I talk about how to make good decisions with your money and how to navigate through the, the financial world and one of the key themes that we've been hitting on is just how important it is to to think critically and how if you don't think critically, you don't make good decisions and then you you, you mess up your money as well as other things in life. And um, re- recently we talked to uh, I talked to Richard Kahn, who had written a book about what gets in the way of critical thinking and how to intervene early with kids and raise them to be critical thinkers. And Aaron, you um if you have you do the same thing. You take you've taken a lot of young people who have a lot of barriers and a lot of challenges getting in the way of their ability to think critically and somehow you've removed those barriers. Can you um I mean those of you who've seen the movie probably have seen Aaron in front of this uh, walk into this classroom that I would never walk into. I mean, it was pretty scary for me to to see the situation you were in. And um, how did you get there? I mean, how did you end up in front of those those kids at at the what what I don't know how old you were, but you were pretty young at the time. Well, it, it's so funny. Uh, this is our thirtieth anniversary, and. And oftentimes when I'm standing in a room full of students, I think they do the math and then they look me up and down and they often say, you look a lot older than that woman that played you. Um, <laughs> and that that is a daunting way to start when you're in a room full of students who have seen Hilary Swank uh, portray me in the film. But 30 years ago, I think it's really important to go back to what was happening in in my community. Um, I I live in Long Beach now. I I did not live in Long Beach when I began teaching, but as an Angelina living in in Los Angeles, we had the Los Angeles riots in 1992. And what, what followed was a lot of devastation, you know, riots and, and burning and, and homicides. And prior to that, I, was under the assumption that I I might go off to law school. But I made this kind of existential decision that rather than stand in a courtroom with judge and jury, that I'd rather stand in the classroom in, in front of kids, specifically teenagers, who were impacted by what I was watching in my community unfold. And so the irony that you you talk about critical thinking and money was something that became a part of our story. Because even though I'm an English teacher and I usually teach in terms of of words, our story took us out of my classroom and we needed money to do some of the things that we've done over the last 30 years. When, When we wanted to have brand new books, I had to figure out a way, how do I raise the money to buy 150 copies of the diary of Anne Frank or, when I wanted to take my students to the Museum of Tolerance and meet Holocaust survivors. How do I raise money for that? And when I wanted to see films like Schindler's List at a movie theater in in my community, how do we do that? Um, Economically, it's been something we've we've had to work on 
for 30 years. We eventually figured out how do we take every single one of these students to Auschwitz-Birkenau in Poland? How do we create a nonprofit? How do we send freedom writers to college? And the one thing that was consistent in all of these kind of moonshot moments was my students didn't have two pennies to rub together. Uh, their parents did not have the economic wherewithal to, to write a check, to put something on their visa, to donate. So we had to be really crafty and figure out if we're gonna do these big lofty things such as buy a book, meet a Holocaust survivor, eventually go to a concentration camp in Europe, how do we do that collectively together starting with zero? And so over the last 30 years, it's been, my brain has been fixated on the words, not weapons, but also fixated on the economic wherewithal to take an idea and turn it into a reality. Well, and it it sounds also, I mean, I, we were talking before, uh, before, before we got on, that you actually collaborate and you, you have been working with these students now, even after they, they graduated. It sounds like they were part of the, that economic solution that you actually had to recruit them to start to think critically about how are we going to pay for this? I walked into this experience 30 years ago, straight out of the halls of academia. Um, once I decided I was going to be a teacher, I, I went to graduate school and also worked on my teaching credential. And so I walked in to a classroom and my, my scholars were all folks who had PhDs. My students, on the other hand, who had just come from the streets and riots and homicides and even incarceration had what I called a PhD of the streets. And mm -hmm. I thought if we can, if we can merge the two, if we can take that hustle and that street smart from my students um, and academically figure out how to merge these two. And so often when they talk about the freedom writers, they use words like mission and cause and, and movement. And so for 30 years, they have been a part of this journey. And, you know, for the first four years, it was butts in seats in room 203. For the last two decades, it has been boots on the ground and freedom writers spreading their message. And thanks to the book and thanks to the movie, uh, the freedom writers have been to all 50 states in person and a couple dozen countries. And, and once again, that's all economics. Like how, how do we take this message and, and take it someplace else? How do, how do we afford mm -hmm. to go? We, you know, Freedom Riders wanted to visit the places we'd read about. How do we go to Anne Frank's attic in Amsterdam? How do we go to the streets of Sarajevo uh, based on the book, Zlata's Diary, A Child's Life in, in Bosnia, Herzegovina. How do we do these things? So I'm, I'm fascinated to share, but I'm also intrigued, Peter, to learn from you because we, we've been doing this instinctually and it's always been very scary for me mm -hmm. because it was not my lane. It was, <laughs> it was trial and error and desperation and, and making a lot of asks, getting a lot of rejection and fearlessly asking again. But I, I'm sure that on this podcast, you can teach me a thing or two. Well, one of the things that's um, one of my philosophies is that, you you know, that a lot of people say you start with theory and then you apply it in practice. And I don't think it works that way. I think actually most theory comes from practice. Most theory comes from people saying, asking questions or having a task that they have to do and they work up solutions and they do it by trial and error. I mean, I know that's how, you know, that's how the field of actuarial science developed. It, it started with trial and error. And, and, you know, you, you, you say, well, I think this risk is worth this. And then you lose your shirt doing that and you have to try again. So um, I think um, you, you, you have a, a laboratory that is um, with with all of these little scientists that have, uh, you know, created some new theory um, through their through their practice. So, you know, to be really honest, when it, when it became the scientist and the lab of of we, rather yeah. than 
the I, I think initially I was too scared to ask because I was like any, any teacher, I was, I was afraid of rejection and, and I had been rejected. I, I went to the chair of my English department and I wanted to read the diary of Anne Frank. They said, no, I, I went to the, the principal and wanted to take my students on a field trip. They said, no, um, I, I had asked people for these amazing opportunities that I thought would be part of a, a, a critical shift for my students. When they said no, I just got stubborn. And I thought, well, we're gonna do it at night and we're gonna do it on a weekend and we're gonna do it when we don't have school. And I'd, I myself had been a hustler putting myself through college. And so I got three additional jobs along the way to pay for these schemes. So at one point I was working at a department store and another point I was working as a concierge at a hotel. And then I started teaching night school um, at a university. And once the Freedom Writers realized, oh my God, they call me Miss G. Miss G is paying for these books. Miss G is paying for this museum or these movie tickets. How can we help her? That's when things change. And it was exciting because they had that, that hustle in them and that PhD in them. And I think that's when I saw the shift in, in me doing it alone, Mm -hmm. And them having skin in the game mm -hmm. was when we had this crazy scheme of inviting the woman who had hid Anne Frank mm -hmm. to come into our world. Mm -hmm. She was 87. She lived in Amsterdam. She was, she was iconic. And I did not think we could do it. So I did not send the letters to her asking her to come because I didn't want my students to go through the same rejection economically that I knew would happen if we had to buy her an airline ticket or, or put her in a hotel. So mm -hmm. I thought, how do I take this crazy idea that they have and squash it? Because when they really understand how much things cost, there's no way we can do it. Mm -hmm. And they figured out a way and she came. And And I think that's once once we we had a little stamina, uh, economically things changed. And one of my freedom writers said, if Miss G says we're going to the moon, somebody better call NASA. So <laughs> we've made a joke throughout the years that NASA is on our speed dial. And now I think we need to call Elon Musk instead if we want to go to the moon. Um, but going to Mars. <laughs> we're going to go to Mars. But I, I think once the freedom writers realized, you know, we, we can think outside the box. And if it's a we and it's a collective, then we also get to be the beneficiaries. Well, you know, um, one of the things that's that struck me um, in 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 the movie, and it's obviously the movie is almost exactly the what happened in 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 life. So I really, and that's a, that's a rare thing when you when you watch a movie and you say, oh, well, that really happened. Um, but it was the what you were modeling. I think was no fear that. And there, there is so much fear that gets in the way of making good decisions and of thinking critically. And I don't know, that was one of the takeaways I, I took from the movie is how you were fearless and you just, oh. and, and you modeled that fearlessness and the kids sort of got it. Um, and I appreciate you saying that because I, I often feel like a duck calm on the surface and just like frantic beneath the water. And and I was terrified then. And 30 years later, I'm still terrified because we have these crazy schemes even to this day and, and trying to figure out how to make something for nothing. And we've had a lot of grit and a lot of moments of divinity that have helped us along the way. Mm -hmm. um, but as I say, the, the, I think the biggest fear was fear of failure mm. or fear of rejection. Um, because what I intuitively wanted to always create was an, an inclusive environment based on fairness, mm -hmm. knowing the world's not fair. Mm -hmm. And, and, and my, my intuition was if it's transactional, mm -hmm. then it stops being fair because so many of my kids had a father who was dead or incarcerated. So many of my kids had a mom who worked two or three jobs. So many of my kids were homeless or had lived in shelters. And so 
some of the things that we wanted to raise money for in that in that idea of before we raise money for this, we we got to make sure they got a roof over their head and they've got food on the table. Mm-hmm. So I never wanted to to make the parents of these students be part of that transaction because I mm-hmm. just knew they didn't have it. So how do we go outside of the family home? Mm-hmm. How do we how do we branch outside of our comfort zone and find like-minded caring adults who are who are willing to donate or better yet how do we create something of value that we could charge like that maybe a service that we can render that could be transactional and that's always been the the fun part is finding the caring adult who is going to donate to some cause and Mm -hmm. and making herself worthy but also finding the transactional element of of what is it worth for a tutor or for a speech or for this service Mm -hmm. that then you could pay. And I think one of my favorite moments when we were raising money is we were, we were trying to honor a Holocaust survivor Mm -hmm. and none of my students are Jewish, but we've, we learned that the number 18 is very symbolic in, Mm -hmm. in Jewish culture. And oftentimes with donations, they donate in terms of 18 or 36 or 180, so we were going to make these buttons that would have a name of someone who's no longer with us. And at that time, it was based on people who'd lost their lives to violence or homicides. In our city, we had 126 murders in a single year. Wow. So the idea was we can make these buttons for 25 cents, mm-hmm. but we can go ask, you know, at a church or a synagogue or a mosque, someone who's lost a child or a father or a friend or a nephew or a neighbor, mm-hmm. and, and maybe they'll buy this button for $5. And when the Freedom Riders approached Mel Mermelstein, who was an Auschwitz survivor, he bought buttons for $18 mm-hmm. for his entire family who mm-hmm. perished at Auschwitz. And it was this moment of, we are, we are doing something that's bigger than ourselves mathematically 18 is a lot more than that five dollars we wanted to sell that button for but that name that's going to be on that button is so symbolic that you know we we got to dress up when we wear that button we we can we can ask other people who do you want us to represent when we wear that button and it was that was part of something that was so beautiful is it was an economic lesson that i was teaching Mm -hmm. but it became a historical lesson and it and it fostered that feeling of a cause mm-hmm. that as as we are doing this door to door, church to church, synagogue to synagogue, that it is bigger than ourselves. Right. Well, I I love what you say about how um, the to staying away from tran- transactional and yet incorporating money into it because that is the that is the uh, the challenge and that's what I. You know, I've also been talking a little bit about the sharing economy where, you know, you get away from, you know, transactions and and obligations and contracts and you're now into relatedness and sharing is a kind of a community based and you create a community where it's not, it, it is value. Value is very important. But value is not necessarily measured in just transactions. It's it's because, in fact, in, oftentimes you can't measure measure it at all. I mean, what is the value of that button? I mean, is it eighteen dollars? Is it five dollars? Or is it priceless? I mean, it's you know. I'm glad you said that because I I think what happened for community is I took all of these students who were strangers who lived in a community that had demarcated gang territory and we created family. Mm -hmm. And so when Mel Mermelstein showed us the beauty of the $18 button, he also wanted to join our family. And he was the one that planted the seed. Mm -hmm. You know, you read night by Ellie was Allen. You went to the movie theater and you saw Schindler's list. Can you imagine if you escort me back to Auschwitz and he planted the seed and now he was part of our community. And the next thing we're doing is how, how do we raise money 
to go to Auschwitz with Mel Mermelstein, who's going to take us to crematorium number four, where he lost his mother and his sisters. And so the beautiful thing and the fearful thing is the ante just kept growing. Like first it was just to meet a survivor and then it was to go to where the survivor experienced uh, that story. And, mm -hmm. and I think what we learned along the way is that, you know, we all are storytellers. So how can we also use our story as a way for people to want to give? You right. know, we, we tried that this year um, uh, for our 30th year. We did our, our annual holiday fundraiser. We called it 30 for 30. And the idea was, you know, for teachers, you know, if you just don't go to Starbucks for six days, you know, that's $30. Or if you if you take your lunch um, and don't go to McDonald's. And, and we found that people were so willing for $30 to send us $30 for the holiday that we could use for our scholarship program. And it was a smaller ask, but we ended up getting more because it was symbolic. And it was, you know, can you help us for our 30th year? And then we started getting checks for 300, which was kind of exciting. It was like, well, we'll, we'll we see you're 30 and we'll raise you some. Um, so I, I think in, in the world, ironically now I'm in the nonprofit world, the Freedom Myers Foundation, Every single time we come up with a new idea, it's trying to give that idea a purpose. Mm -hmm. And if we're asking for help, we want the person who is helping us to feel valued and mm -hmm. to realize what, what they're helping us to has, has great validity. You know, um, this is, it's just amazing what, what you've done and how, what you continue to do. But I'd like to go back to the beginning a little bit because, again, where where I um, where my passion is is removing the barriers that get in people's way to thinking clearly, thinking critically, and making good decisions. And I'd like to talk a little bit about you know back to if you if you don't mind if it's sure. not too traumatic to you to go back to that first moment when you walked in and. What did you see as the big barriers that were getting in the way? I mean, clearly fear, fear of the other, but, and maybe ec economic deprivation and hunger and, you know, need, but what, what were the, what were the big barriers that got in the way of people's kids thinking clearly? We had just had a riot. So it was social insecurity, uh, mm. social economic insecurity. It was abject poverty it was trauma and triggers it was unbelievable intolerance and bigotry and racism and as as was portrayed in the film it it, it came to a note there was this horrific note a caricature of sorts that i intercepted and in that moment i i wanted to shame my students about man's inhumanity. And it starts, it could start with a note that I paralleled and juxtaposed to propaganda I'd seen with the with Jewish artists who were being depicted from the, the Nazi soldiers who were trying to dehumanize um, during during the, the lead up to the Holocaust. So I, I thought if I can use something that is so much bigger than what's happening right now in this classroom, to show where where you are you are headed with your bigotry and, and prejudice and intolerance, that's a really good learning lesson. Um, I had no idea that I would be able to expand that that conversation to a trip to a museum, mm -hmm. to a meeting of a Holocaust survivor, to reading of books. Um, I just knew at that moment that it was so wrong that if I sent these boys away, that's what they were used to. They Every every boy that was in my class had already been sent away mm -hmm. since kindergarten. They were, they were already part of a school to prison pipeline. They had already, you know, they already had a rap sheet. So I thought, how do I get them to stay? And if they stay, maybe that's the cultural shift. Maybe we can have critical conversations about racism. And it is hard to hate who you know. So we got to get to know each other. And ah. 
the irony is 30 years later, those boys are my ambassadors. Those boys I take everywhere. Those boys, you know, the first in their family to graduate, the first in their family to go to college, the first in their families to send their kids to college. And so that's where that fusion came up is when, when your family, your, your ride or die, it's a, it's a life decision. So the life decision I made early on is, oh my God, if, if I'm going to talk about them going to college, how do we make this a reality? Because none of them have money to do so. If, if we're going to talk about the power of higher education, how do we find people who look like them and talk like them and came from where they came from? and went to college so that they have someone to look to you and say, I, I look like you, I talk like you, I, I wanna be like you. Because the people they were looking up to until that point was the rapper, the basketball star, the movie icon. And there's not, there's not enough rappers, movie stars and athletes that they mm -hmm. can become. So how do I go find someone of substance who has a bachelor's degree or a master's degree or or is a lawyer or a doctor so they can say oh my god what did they have to do so i can do it too right so you so you it sounds like you really broke down the barriers to getting to know each other because people people were afraid to i mean they just they had this fear of the other they had this repelling they they were as you say a, a whole bunch of things that um, were getting in the way um and you were able to do it and now you're able to leverage it and i want to get to the leveraging part of it because one of the um one of the challenges that i see in community based um solutions um and the sharing economy and and over is scalability is how do you scale it up and um you know it sounds like part of it is that you've recruited you know, all of your students to be part of the this movement or to move it out. Um, but, you know, things things get diluted, you know, when you get when you when you when you get more than a couple of degrees of separation um, apart. And um, what I found interesting is, I guess you, you tried to put you've tried to put this in a guide and I love this, the, the Mrs. G's secret sauce. And <laughs> I, I yeah. printed out. So oh. could you, for, for, for those of us who, you know, the, the people who are listening, who are interested in what is it that, what, what is it that can take, can get a, a younger person to get past their fears and, and desperation and all the other to, to start to think critically? What, can you talk about some of the key ingredients in that's that secret sauce? So for, for those that are only familiar with the film, or maybe they are listening for the first time and they don't even know who I am. Um, part of what my students did was put down their fist, pick up a pen and write. And, and our tagline was write what needs to be written in honor of, of, a, of a young girl in an attic named Anne Frank, in honor of a young boy in a cattle car uh, named Ellie Wiesel, who wrote about his experience at Auschwitz. Like how can we use words not weapons to be your legacy. And in the process of them writing, um, we decided that we were going to try to publish our story in, in vignettes in diary fashion in the way that Anne Frank had. Um, so we were able to publish a book called The Freedom Writer's Diary. And initially with The Freedom Writer's Diary, the economic uh, transaction with one of the largest publishing house in America, I decided was we're gonna, we're gonna, the owner of the copyright, we're gonna start a little nonprofit and we're all gonna be members of the nonprofit. And so rather than giving you a small slice of the pie to go buy a pair of sneakers, you can only have access to the pie if you go to college. And that piece of the pie will pay for your course or your books or your tuition. So it's gonna be an academic pie, um, which was really exciting. Like we're gonna be each other's scholarship grantees. Um, wow. The same thing um, when, when the book came out, all of a sudden people were reading it and we, we didn't realize that it would actually be 
used in classes the way that I used Anne Frank or other, other great books as an English teacher. And then there was this moment where we realized that they wanted to make it into a film. And it was terrifying because we thought if they do a really bad job, will people still read the book? Um, so how do we get involved in this process to make sure the movie's really good? But what do we do with this process to continue to have that pie pay mm -hmm. it forward? So we decided that with the movie, we wanted to bring teachers into our fold and give them a scholarship and give them the opportunity to learn from myself and my original students. And we would bestow them this title, Freedom Writer Teacher. And initially that was the idea that we'll bring some, some teachers in and we will make a, a teacher's guide, which you refer to the Freedom Writers Diaries Teacher's Guide. And if these teachers come, maybe we'll send them away and they'll be better. Maybe they'll be better than me. That was our hope. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that we realized then that the movie would be as, as beautifully told as it was. I don't think we realized then that the, the book would become this international phenomenon in classrooms around the globe because the book started getting translated. Um, and then what we realized is since we still had this ability to, to have money coming in from the book, um, how do we continue to pay it forward? And that's what we've been doing ever since is continuing to give scholarships, continuing to educate teachers, and every time, hopefully they'll do it better. You know, take my secret sauce when I didn't know what I was doing and I was afraid and do it better. And in, in our teacher's guide, we call it engage, enlighten and empower. How do, how do you engage kids that don't wanna learn like the students I originally had? How do you enlighten them with the subject matter in which you're gonna teach? You know, I was an English teacher, but you could be a science teacher, a math teacher, an economics teacher. Mm -hmm. How do you engage them and enlighten them in your subject matter? But then most importantly, and this is what you do on your podcast so beautifully, how do you empower them to then do it better? Mm -hmm. And so for you, the empowerment of your listeners is how do you inspire them to have the wherewithal after listening to you to be more conscious of, of that economics that you're you're providing. And so in my secret sauce, that was my idea is how do I get these teachers and kids who we're gonna be exposed to, to go out in the world and be inclusive? Well, you know, it it's it's kind of amazing. And I didn't, you know, I thought, you know, I thought the movie ended and the and the kids all went to college and you were you went along with them and everything. What I didn't realize is you actually there was a post-graduation project, which is, hey, let's let's make a business. Let's let's um and you actually have created a business and and really tremendous um training uh for these kids to be critical thinkers and make great decisions. So and I Peter, guess, it's still scary. I, I I'm gonna be honest with you. 10 minutes before I jumped on the computer we have a new scheme. We have an event that we're planning. And there's this fear that I have today, 30 years later, which is similar to the fear I had 30 years ago. How do we raise the money? What if people don't come? And, and you would think I would have figured it out by now. You would think I would be resting on my laurels by now. No, <laughs> I'm <laughs> still scared. I'm still afraid, but I also have faith. You know, there's a part of me that thinks yeah, they're going to come. There's right. going to be some sleepless nights. Um, I guess that's it. I guess that's the key. Is it you? You, you can't get away from feeling the fear, yeah. but you you can still think through it and and have the confidence that it's going to work out. You know, I, I, unfortunately, I think we're coming to the to the end of our time. But um, and like I like I said, I'd love to keep talking to you for for, for an hour, but. Um, what what's next? I mean, what are you doing? I mean, let, I mean, obviously everybody should go and see Freedom Writers and um, follow your uh, not for profit. But what's what 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 is coming up next for you? Wow, that's a great question. Well, like I said, this is our thirtieth year, and and in that we, I I have created monsters. They think that they can change the world one kid, one class, one community at a time, and I, I think they may just do that. Um, one of the 
beautiful things that we are planning, which I mentioned when be moments before before our podcast call, was we like to pay homage to people that came before us and and themes that have come before us. And so every year we we have what we call a symposium. And, and we invite the freedom writers and the teachers we've served to, to really do something big um, to allow teachers to go back in the classrooms feeling like they are warriors and, and, and making the world a better place. So we were planning, ironically, before you called, how to pay homage to a woman we met 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. She will be 100 years old this spring. And so part of our gathering is we're gonna have a birthday party for what I like to call the prettiest girl in the room. She's gonna be a hundred years young. She's been our, our adopted grandma for 30 years. Mm -hmm. And um, I can't imagine a world without her. And so, I can't imagine teaching without her. And at a hundred years young, there will come a time where we have to tell her story for her. You know, she she was able to bear her soul so we could bear witness. So we're going to raise some money so that we can continue telling her story. Um, after October 7th, sadly, um, her her home was desecrated with horrific words. And she mm. had a flashback back to before she went to Auschwitz and thought mm. the world is upside down once again. So we're we're going to figure out how to put the world back together again. I don't wow. know how and I don't know when, but she's our muse and she's our, our, our moonshot. And I just want to do right by her. Um, and I hope that she can inspire not only my freedom writers, but the teachers that we humbly serve and the community in which we'll respond. Wow. Well, that sounds like a, so you're planning a birthday party. We're That's planning, what you're planning a one heck of a party. <laughs> and, um, you're going to tell us what you're going to tell us about as, as it gets more shape and it gets more, um, it, we'll, we'll hear about it. Right. Oh, absolutely. I hope, I hope so. Um, we, we want to pay, pay her homage mm -hmm. and we like to set up a scholarship in her name. And I've already, I already thought of the first teacher I want to give a scholarship to. There's a teacher that I met who lost many students at Parkland, um, in Parkland at, at Marjorie Stoneman uh, Douglas School. Mm -hmm. And he t had taught uh, the Holocaust and he taught the Freedom Writers Diary. And I just found out in Florida, our, our book was banned along with a lot of books oh. um, about the Holocaust I am, and Frank being one of them. So I wanna raise enough money to make that particular teacher who was who had already lost students, um, now he's losing a part of his livelihood, which is in a free society, we're not allowing kids to read freely. So I hope we can raise enough money to make that amazing teacher, Darren Levin, um, wow. a freedom writer teacher. Um, and that's one of the things I wanna do is, is give him a scholarship to come and be a part of our family. What what so what's 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 the name of the hundred year old woman and the, uh, her name is Renee Firestone. Renee Firestone and the the this the teacher and that you're giving this uh, the teacher is Darren Levin L E V L E V I N E and he's at uh, Marjorie uh, Douglas uh, I don't know if I'm saying the right the the Parkland School that had the horrific mass shooting. Mm -hmm. He's an English teacher and he has has taught for years about the Holocaust and about the Freedom Riders. And so I just think that he would be the perfect recipient. And so my eyes on the prize. Um, and I, we're going to race it. We're going to yes. race it. And we're going to honor Renee and we're going to do some good. I have no doubt you will succeed on this as well as everything else that you've done so far. So, Aaron, it, this has been a real treat. I really, really appreciate you coming on and, and sharing your story and sharing the wonderful stuff you're doing and i'm going to buy that book because i have a collection oh. of banned books <laughs> i love that you're gonna get your hands on bad book um i'm glad that you asked about renee's name if you have seen the movie there's a scene in the feature film where there was four holocaust survivors mm -hmm. and they played they played themselves and renee was one of those four ah, so okay. she is 
Forever Immortal in our movie. Uh, Steven Spielberg made a documentary that featured her that won an Academy Award called The Last Days. And so Renee will live on forever, but we, you know, we want to honor the forever that she's put in our hearts. Great. Well, again, thank you so much for, for coming on and, and best of luck and, and happy birthday, Renee. Thank you. Okay. Well, Aaron, you never cease to amaze. Thank you so much oh, for being on Money Mountain Aaron with Peter Newart. Um, you are listening to this amazing woman. She is the Freedom Writer Foundation founder, award-winning educator, and best-selling author, Aaron Gruel. Today, we were talking about educating well is the ultimate sharing economy, and clearly, that is what you are doing. You are the gift that keeps on giving. So thank you. It just brings tears to my eyes. You're amazing. So thank you, Aaron. Thank you, Pete. I'm Hope Katz Gibbs, proud producer of the show on Incandescent Radio and Incandescent TV, and we will talk to you again next month, and we will keep you apprised of all that Aaron is up to. Take good care, everybody. Thank you so much. Yeah.